Welcome back to the 13 Films of Halloween on Film Master Reviews. I'm Adam J. Well, this is it, folks. We're finally here. After today, I will have reviewed every single Halloween film. And, for better or for worse, it's been a long, trying, and traumatizing road, to say the least. Man, that bitch got herself a nice little dumper. What did you just say? You heard me. No, say it again, Ronnie. Say it to my face. Oh, what's the matter? You jealous young daughter's ass, huh? Mmm, <clears throat> that hurt. Trick or treat, motherfucker. Ooh, that was painful, too. Oh, God. You know whose baby it is, don't you? Michael! The baby is yours, isn't it? Isn't it, Michael? Excuse me, I need to throw up. <laughs> but through all the ups and downs, I get to share all my joys and pains with all of you. I'm glad you bastards care so much. But now here comes along a sequel that largely wipes the slate clean for the... fifth time, and presents itself as a direct sequel to the original film. It erases the twist of Michael being Laurie's brother, which was introduced in part two, and tries going back to basics. Michael is still the embodiment of evil, but he's still a man. He's not the invincible killing machine that he became in the sequels, nor is he Laurie's brother, making it less problematic. So it does go back to those basic elements. Now guys, I won't lie, I was beyond pumped for this movie. Oh, you have no idea. At the time of doing this review, I have now seen it three times. So that I can give you a proper analysis of what I thought of the film. Because I honestly believe that I could not draw a proper analysis only seeing the movie one time. I, I didn't think it was possible. So, I saw it more than once. And I'm glad that I saw it all those times because with each passing viewing, I started noticing more problems with the movie. That being said, I still liked it a lot. There's still enough here for me to consider this film a worthy successor to John Carpenter's original. That being said, I would not say it's my favorite sequel, and I would certainly not say that it is in any way better than the original film. Like, it's not even close. So let me start out with my positives, because there are quite a few. First and foremost, the opening of this movie is one of the best in the entire series. It's such a creepy and intense opening that it gets you hooked from the word go. The scene is followed by an opening title sequence, which mimics the ones from Halloween and Halloween 2. This put a big smile on my face, and I was just pumped from there. Like, honestly, each time I see the opening scene, I like it more. Jamie Lee Curtis? She's fantastic in this. The scenes of her going Sarah Connor on Michael's ass are great, and what makes them realistic is that Lori is scared shitless but prepared. She is only human and she accepts that she will probably die going up against Michael, but she doesn't care. Like I said about her in the original film, she isn't helpless, but she is scared. She's very scared, but underneath all that fear is a survivor. She will fight this fucker to the death if she has to, and that makes her so much more compelling to me. Now much like I just did a few seconds ago, a lot of people have really made the Sarah Connor comparison, but I don't see a problem with that. Yeah, they basically turn Laurie Strode into Sarah Connor, but if you're looking for inspiration for an updating a beloved heroine, Terminator 2 ain't a bad place to go. Also, keep this in mind, Sarah Connor in the original Terminator and Laurie Strode in the original Halloween are very similar to begin with. Really think about this for a minute. They both start as young, naive sweethearts, but their survival instincts grow throughout both of their respective films. In the sequels, they go through similar transitions, as no one believes or understands either of them, and they both know that their monsters are indeed coming back. Michael for Laurie, the Terminator for Sarah. So, I really don't see any issues, because as far as I'm concerned, that comparison was always there. It shows me that Danny McBride and David Gordon Green clearly understood the character and how she should grow as a person after her horrific ordeal. Michael Myers? Probably the best he's been since the original. 
He moves like Michael from the original, and it feels like classic Michael throughout most of the film, and I really loved that. I even like the scenes before he has the mask, because the camera work does a really good job at hiding his face. You see the front of his face maybe twice in the movie, but each time is only for a split second. Blink and you'll miss it. Other times, they shoot his face from the side or cover him in darkness, which is also pretty cool. They really understood the direction that Carpenter went for in his film in regards to Michael, and they nailed that for the most part. The climax of this movie is fantastic. In fact, there's a particular scene involving a bedroom and some mannequins that gave me absolute chills. There's also points of the story that I really like. I like that the film actually explores mental instability in not just Michael, but Lori as well. She has, after 40 years, never stopped waiting for Michael to come back. She wants to be the one to kill him. She survived him and believes that this is what she is meant to do. You clearly see how the events of the first film affect not only her, but the people around her. She raised her daughter, John Connor style, and her daughter resents her for it. When the film focuses on these aspects, it's rather interesting. Really, I love the whole PTSD angle they were going for. David Gordon Green did a fairly good job directing this film and making it feel like a proper companion piece to the original. He recreates a lot of scenes and moments from the original in unique ways and is clearly a fan of the series. Gordon Green finds clever ways to homage the original while still doing his own thing. He also sets up several sequences in this film that are filled with genuine tension and dread. He has a great use of background shots that are creepy and does his best to capture the spirit of the original. Honestly, he wasn't a bad choice for this, despite some of the bad movies he's made in the past. Lastly, I gotta say the score for this movie is the best it has been since Alan Howard's score in Halloween 4. It, it's a masterpiece. It is badass, especially towards the climax with Michael and Laurie. John Carpenter returned to do the score alongside his son, and he clearly brought his A-game. Now, we move on to the negatives. Listen, there are many great aspects to this story. There really are. When it focuses on Lori, her PTSD, and her relationship with her daughter. When it focuses on these elements, it's great. That being said, Lori is not in this movie nearly enough. You'd think a movie that was relentlessly pushing a badass Lori Strode in the marketing would include more of her. Now, I have no problem with this movie being a slow burn. In fact, that's like a staple of the series. Most of them have been slow burns. The original was a slow burn. H2O was a slow burn. Halloween 4 was a slow burn. None of these things bother me. Those are some of the, the ones I just mentioned are like some of my more favorite films in the franchise. And they all took their time. But here's the difference between those and this. Those films were a slow burn for a purpose. Setting up characters, tone, and most of all, atmosphere. Probably the biggest sin that this new Halloween film commits is that it spends so much time on characters who are entirely pointless that it fails to establish an atmosphere and a tone. It sets up Laurie and Michael well, but it really wastes so much of its cast and feels all over the place. First and foremost, granddaughter in this movie, Alison Strode. She could have been written out of this movie entirely. Hardly anything would have changed plot-wise, and you'd have a much tighter film. I honestly think that they only included this character just to give Lori something kind of new to work with. We can't just give her a son, we've seen that. We can't just give her a daughter, we've seen that. So we'll give her a granddaughter. Genius! Now, I've heard interviews from Curtis Carpenter and Green about how this was supposed to be a film about generations, and how the effect of one generation's torment can affect their families. This was an intriguing concept, but it's never really explored. So many characters, especially Allison, feel like they're only here to run around and scream and be pointless. I don't know what the decision-making process here was, but it, it was baffling. Not only do Allison and her friends take away so much time from Laurie Strode, but because we follow them so much, Laurie's own daughter, Karen, barely has any character. She doesn't really get much to do, and that was upsetting to me. Look, I'm not going to beat around the bush. Like most fans out there, I wanted Danielle Harris in this role. But when I heard Judy Greer was playing the role, I was perfectly fine with it. I was so happy to finally hear that Judy Greer was being given a substantial role after being underutilized in tentpole films again and again and again and again. But here, while her performance is fine, she barely has shit to do until the end of the movie. They wasted Judy Greer in yet another thankless role. 
It's not that the relationship between Karen and Lori isn't there. Oh no, it's there. But because it's not explored enough, it feels very slapped together and rushed. Again, Greer is fine in the role, her and Curtis have decent chemistry, so I can buy them as mother and daughter, but I wish they had given Greer a bigger part to work with. Also, they give Judy Greer probably the cheesiest line of dialogue I have ever heard in a Halloween film. Or really, the cheesiest line I've heard ever. Uh, dear God. Okay, so, Lori, I'm just gonna paint the scene for you. Lori is in, their ha in her house saying, Oh, well, Michael's gonna come back! You gotta be prepared! Here, take a gun! And Judy Greer is kicking her out of the house, and she says something like this. No, Mommy, the world isn't a cruel and dark place. The world is full of peace and love and understanding and gumdrops and rainbows and shit. <laughs> okay, she didn't say gumdrops and rainbows, but you get the idea. Uh, oh dear god, it was so corny. I could not take it seriously. I just couldn't. When she said that line, like, everyone in the theater was just busting out laughing. It was just really bad. That one scene, and I can't blame Greer for that. That's just the dialogue that was written for her that she had to say. Like, that, that bit of dialogue was just atrocious. I don't know why that wasn't written out. I just, I just don't. I, I'm sorry to dwell so long on this, but dear God, <laughs> what the hell was that doing in a Halloween film? There's two characters in this movie making a documentary about Michael Myers, and I loved this concept. I really did. It was like making a murderer, but for Michael Myers. I thought that was such a cool idea. You know, because today, that's all you see. You see all these big exposés and documentaries on these, you know, serial killers. So... The fact that they had two people doing it for Michael Myers, I thought that was such a cool concept. But much like so many of the other characters in this movie, they're wasted as well. They're just wasted. Like, the movie does not give them enough to do. The movie establishes a presence for them at the very beginning. They're in a couple scenes after that, and then... It... I don't get why you introduced all these cool things and you just wasted them. It, it really bugs the crap out of me. These two characters, the only thing I can conclude for them being in the movie is that they were literally just there so Michael would have an excuse to get his mask back. I am not even kidding. Karen's husband in this film is the most insufferable jackass since Tommy Doyle in Halloween 6. Oh, sweet Jesus, where to even begin with this guy? I, I wanted to punch him in the face whenever he was on screen. In his opening scene in this movie, he's talking to his daughter, his own daughter, and makes the comment, Oh, I got peanut butter on my penis. Huh? Like, really? This is what we've been reduced to? And this happens throughout the film. This idiot doesn't get any better. Now, there's a kid in this movie who's being babysat. He is hilarious. Oh, dear God. When this kid showed up and he's talking, oh, God, is this kid funny. I'm like, okay, this kid's got a bright future ahead of him because he he's stealing the movie right now. He is just stealing the movie. Not only does he just disappear, too. <laughs> Again, like, every cool character just goes bye-bye. I don't know why that decision was made. But it was. <laughs> I liked the relationship with him and his babysitter, and I thought it was funny and cute. Then there's a scene where Michael is attacking someone, and this kid is still cracking jokes. And the movie is trying to make us laugh when we should be scared. This is the very definition of being tonally inconsistent. We should be frightened by this scene with Michael, but we aren't because we're too busy laughing at this kid. There's another scene with two dumbass cops trying to be funny in their car, talking about their lunch. And it was just weird, and it did nothing for me. And it's a shame that we're focusing on all this bad comedy instead of focusing on Laurie. Now, there's a Loomis knockoff in this movie, and even the most diehard defenders of this film have said that a certain plot point with him at the end was just dumb. However, I didn't see it as dumb. Not only did it answer some questions I had from the beginning of the film, it actually answers a long-debated question from the original, if you really think about it. 
It also brings another theme to the film about how Michael's acts affect him personally. Is he really an unfeeling demon, or is there more to him psychologically that we have yet to see? So the turn itself for the character didn't bother me. What did bother me was that they did nothing with it after that! They subtly hinted at things and left it open for the audience to figure out, but then when the turn happens, they abandon it less than 10 minutes later. It answers questions, yet feels so needless. I was actually really bummed out by this. This could have been such a cool turn, but they just botched it, ironically, by doing absolutely nothing with it. Great concept, but such a waste. Lastly, another big issue I had with this film was its continuity with the first film. Ignoring the fact that it has the same title as the first film, which is fucking stupid, by the way. My god, this series is a mess. I, I, I mean, would a subtitle have killed you? You can call it Halloween 2. For realsies this time. You know, still better than calling it the original title. I mean, yeah, I know I should have thought about my made-up title before I turned the camera on. Shut up. But they never show us how Michael ended up in the asylum after part one. They say that Sheriff Hawkins, who at the time was Deputy Hawkins, apprehended Michael and stopped Loomis from killing him. How? How did that happen? Michael took six bullets to the chest and still walked away. How did a deputy just apprehend him? No! They tell us what happened, but they never show us. And it's a bit hard to swallow given everything Michael went through in the first film. They just say, yeah, he was apprehended, accept it and move on. In the end, while Halloween is a bit unfocused with its characters and lacks atmosphere, it's still a damn fine movie. Jamie Lee Curtis is wonderful, Michael hasn't been this terrifying or interesting since the original, and David Gordon Green shoots this film with everything he's got. Regardless of its faults, you could tell Greta McBride really loved the Halloween franchise and wanted to honor what Carpenter established. It struggles to find an atmosphere and at times even the right tone, but it does bring back the feeling of a Halloween film. I can rip certain things to shreds, but the good things in this movie are too damn good to ignore. If this is your favorite Halloween sequel, I wouldn't even argue with you. I don't see it as that, but I certainly get why others would. It's a fine movie with some great moments in it, and I can certainly see that those involved with it were trying their hardest to make Michael Myers a force to be reckoned with once again. In the end, I'm giving Halloween a B. Now I want to talk about something. I know it's going to happen, but listen guys, this just needs to be said. Just end it here. Don't make another fucking sequel. Please don't do it. I implore Blumhouse to just take this and call it your win, because you know damn well you're just gonna fuck it up again. Don't believe me? Let's look at the evidence! Halloween 3 were in a route that people at the time didn't care for, so they brought Michael back with 4. Then 5 and 6 ruined it. So they said, okay, we know we messed up, here's H2O, a direct sequel to Halloween 2, ignoring 3 through 6. And it was awesome! What happened next? Halloween Resurrection came along and ruined it. Then they said, okay, we'll just remake it. So we got Rob Zombie's remake, which was okay at best, but certainly had a lot of potential. Then we had Halloween 2, which, you guessed it, ruined it all over again. Blumhouse, you're just going to be fighting a never-ending cycle of awful sequels. Please, lay Michael Myers to rest. This movie should not have a sequel. Given the ending of this, it has no business having a sequel unless Michael can somehow teleport. But since you're going to do a sequel anyway, here's my suggestion. Do what you originally wanted to do. Make it an anthology series. I know it sounds crazy, but hear me out. It didn't work the first time, but with the success of Cloverfield, Black Mare, and with the massive cult following Season of the Witch has gained over the years, you could easily make this work now. There are so many cool things that you can do with Halloween. It doesn't have to just be about Michael. Leave Michael alone. If you do any sequel with him, it's just going to be resurrection all over again, in the sense that it's just going to make Laurie's whole journey in this film entirely pointless. Now is the time to make it an anthology series, so just do that. He is a killer, but he will be killed tonight. Happy Halloween, Michael.